NTV Television Network presents The Other Day Current Era, 1965, translation and voiceover by BMI Russian. Good evening, and welcome to episode 5 of our series The Other Day, 1961 to 1991. Events, people and occurrences which defined a lifestyle. Things that we can't imagine ourselves without, let alone comprehend. Today we'll be covering 1965. Computers, 20 years since we won the war, the fight against grassland farming, Beatlemania emerging in the Soviet Union, Sholokhov receiving the Nobel Prize, the Vietnam War, Ege motorcycles, and the movie Operation Y. Commenting we have screenwriter and actress Renata Litvinova, economic expert Igor Gaidar, and political expert Sergei Karaganov. The Soviet space program reached new heights. On March 18, 1965, the first ever spacewalk was undertaken. We have liftoff. The Voskhod 2 spacecraft was piloted by Commander Pavel Belyaev together with Alexei Leonov. During their second lap around Earth, Leonov spends a full 20 minutes outside the vessel. We see a man stepping out into space. We have a man in outer space. He's currently in a state of free flight. Do you copy? This was a time when motorcycles were in fashion. Annual car sales in the USSR were quite modest, due to them being prohibitively expensive for most people. In 1965, the Izhevsk factory begins production of the country's two most popular motorcycles, the one-cylinder 13-horsepower Ish Planeta and the two-cylinder 18-horsepower Ish Jupiter. The ideal image for a young person was a guy riding a motorcycle with a gal sitting behind him, air blowing in the wind, since back then the law didn't require you to wear a helmet. Military technical sporting activities blossomed, with some help from Dosav clubs, namely Speedway, Motocross and Motoball. A newspaper article wrote that in Speedway racers do battle not just with their opponents, but also with their own temperamental iron steeds. They'd call these racers knights on ice. Motorcycle races on ice are a fairly new form of competition, but the youngsters immediately took a liking to them. Edward Keel received an award at the increasingly more popular Sapat International Song Festival. Even at a time when the pop music scene was quite cheerful, this man exuded remarkable optimism. A type of wool similar to fur called mohair becomes popular. This was a long pile of fabric. The yarn had a slight gleam to it, it was warm, lush and durable, and it looked quite lavish and expensive. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Tatar Zhivkov. An unofficial soccer match was held at an overbooked Luzhniki stadium with its capacity of 100,000 spectators, between the USSR national team and two times world champion Team Brazil. And so the long-awaited game begins at last. The odds clearly weren't even. Only during the second period was the Soviet team able to take the fight to their opponent's side of the field. And even then our players weren't able to score any points. Team Brazil won that game with a score of 3-0. Two of those points were scored by Pele and one by Flavio. The best game in Luzhniki Stadium's history was yet another testament to the fact that Brazilian soccer was number one. And that Pele was a brilliant forward. Pele has the ball, and he scores again. The Brazilian players prove that they've earned their status as the world's very best. The Soviet civil aircraft industry's finest hour. 
1965, at the 26th International Air Show in Le Bourget next to Paris, the Soviet Union showcases its new designs, all of which will go on to outlive their respective era. The Soviet Union presented airplanes and helicopters which serve a peaceful purpose. The Mi-10 helicopter, or the flying crane. Mi-10s constantly lugged buses, trucks and power line towers around the taiga. The Tu-134 was the new basic passenger vessel, immortalized by the Bulgarian cigarette brand of the same name. The intercontinental Il-62 was the new flagship, upon which the latest government airliner was based. But the biggest sensation was the gigantic An-22, or Ante. This behemoth had a wingspan of 210 feet and could carry an 80 metric ton payload. Another premiere of that air show was the supersonic Tu-144, the Soviet Concorde, which would come to be known as a symbol of ideology rather than a viable mode of transportation. In 1965, the Lenin Prize was awarded to writer Sergei Smirnov, who wrote a book called Heroes of Brest Fortress. Smirnov restored justice in regards to those heroes of World War II who were found guilty by Soviet authorities. He defended the honor of submariner Marinesco, he wrote about former war prisoner and Italian national hero Fedor Politaev, and the soldiers who defended the Adjimushkai Quarry. However, Smirnov's life's work was Heroes of Brest Fortress. The heroes of the fortress were never pardoned for being surrounded and surrendering. After going through German camps, the surviving protectors of Brest were then sent to prison in the Soviet Union. Smirnov's book told the story of soldiers from two infantry regiments and ten frontier posts, who for an entire month defended what was then considered the Soviet Union's westernmost territory, which at that point was far behind enemy lines. In 1965, Brest was designated as a hero fortress. The title hero was also assigned to Major Gavrilov and Lieutenant Kizhivatov. In 1965, the Soviet Union celebrated the anniversary of our victory in World War II for the first time ever. The first anniversary medals were awarded to war veterans, the first commemorative parade was held at the Red Square, we even got word from our former adversaries. West Germany announced that the statute of limitations for crimes committed during World War II had expired, which deeply insulted the victors of the war. The USSR officially abolished any statutes of limitations for crimes against humanity, with the UN passing the same resolution soon after that. During the commemorative parade, the banner of victory would be carried by Colonel Samsonov and Sergeants Yegorov and Kantaria. Greetings, Suvorov and Nahim of school trainees! I'm here to congratulate you with the 20th anniversary of the Soviet people's victory over Nazi Germany. Marshal Zhukov is exonerated by being mentioned in the speech given at the ceremonial meeting. For eight years before that, he was living in disgrace after being removed from his post as Minister of Defense. For the first time in ten years, Stalin is mentioned in the report. The audience reacts with a round of applause. Active members of underground movements who operated in Ukrainian and Belarusian cities and who died behind enemy lines or in camps were honored posthumously, as was the Soviet Union's resident spy in Rome, Colonel Manevich. Soviet medals were awarded to 26 pilots from the French squadron Normandy Neiman. Moscow and Kiev were designated as hero cities. And those hero cities which were declared as such back in 1945 were now awarded Golden Stars and Lenin Prizes. These included Sevastopol, Odessa. Meanwhile, Stalingrad's honors went to Volgograd, Stalingrad's successor. When Leningrad was receiving its award, they celebrated the widespread heroism which was evident during the blockade. You'd more often than not hear that victory came at a great cost, that not just the army, but the entire nation endured, with Leningrad becoming the unspoken hero among heroes. They would especially emphasize the latest data on war casualties, which was published not too long before the anniversary. 20 million people died. Before that, the official death toll was 7 million. The final two verses from a poem by Olga Berkholz become a formula of sorts. They were carved into a monument at the Piskarovskaya cemetery, which is where they buried the victims of the Leningrad siege. <laughs> 
So many of them under the granite's everlasting protection. But know this, whoever beholds these rocks, nobody is forsaken and nothing is forgotten. Back then you'd quite often see articles on the last pages of newspapers reading that either an excavator operator was digging a trench, or a granny was busy in her garden, or some kids were playing in a gorge and stumbled upon an undetonated World War II era bomb. A bomb squad would be called in from the nearest military base to carefully extract the dangerous finding, sometimes it would even be an entire arsenal, and take it away for disposal. These articles would always end with the words, somewhere outside of city limits an explosion occurred. USSR Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev meets with President Kemal Abdel Nasser. In 1965, at the 4th Moscow International Film Festival, the award for best female role wasn't divided, which is an exceptionally rare situation. Best actress honors went to Sofia Loren, who starred in the movie Marriage Italian Style. Soviet Screen Magazine called her Actress of the Year. The Soviet Union signed its first movie collaboration contract with Italy. Her Cinderella upbringing, sympathetic attitudes towards the left, and willingness to take part in collaborative performances made Sofia Loren the Soviet people's favorite foreign actress. Together with Mastroianni, she was the face of Italy during the time. Artistic truth is one thing, but in real life Sofia was struggling with her own Italian-style marriage. Soviet newspapers were full of sympathy for her troubled relationship with producer Carlo Ponti, who the Vatican was unwilling to divorce from his first wife. Her success in our country was actually just part of Sofia Loren's worldwide acclaim. Her rivalry with Lola Brigida, which was essentially a war of bosoms, she won outright. In 1965, the government admits the need for economic innovation. In March, the Central Committee decides to increase production of consumer goods, and during the September plenary meeting, the committee discusses ideas of cost accounting. These measures would later be dubbed as Kasigin's reforms. Chairman of the Council of Ministers Alexei Kasigin, in his report given during the September plenary meeting, admits there being temporary setbacks in the economy. National income had decreased, Agriculture was bogging down, enterprises had to be given a certain amount of leeway when it came to management and planning. A system of modest material incentives was developed. Also from that point on, instead of manufacturing output, sales figures would become the main measure of performance. Alexei Nikolaevich Kasigin, he was one of the most capable economic managers of the Soviet era. He knew very well, not from books, but from his own personal experience, that reforms were way overdue, that it was time to return to market mechanisms, otherwise the latest goals were simply unattainable. He was the one who wholeheartedly supported economic reforms in the Soviet Union. I reckon that back then, in the mid-60s, that was the last time when the Soviet Union found itself on that crosswalk when there was still a chance to follow the Chinese path. Alexei Kosygin could have been the Soviet Union's Deng Xiaoping. The Communist Party Central Committee was very skeptical of these reforms. They were worried that all of these economic innovations would lead to them losing their political influence. The situation in Czechoslovakia, where this precise thing happened, essentially spelled the end for any sort of radical reforms. The West was infatuated with Herbert Marcuse's theories, the student avant-garde, the revolutionary class. Meanwhile, Soviet society took interest in a more contained form of student community. Students might not have been a separate class, but it was most definitely a profession, which allowed you to lead the most appealing lifestyle. Dorms, notes, and everybody loved the words material resistance, which was a specialized academic discipline. The rule back then went if you passed material resistance, feel free to get married. Student theater and propaganda team contests were held, where you'd hear verses such as everyone, no matter how young or old, about material resistance has been told. Moscow hosted a festival which brought together the country's best student estrada theaters.
The comedy film Operation Y and Shurik's Other Adventures, released in 1965, was seen by 69 million viewers during its first year in theaters, becoming the most watched movie in the entire history of Soviet cinema. The Ministry of Finance was completely blown away by the royalties they had to pay director Leonid Gaidai, which amounted to 70,000 rubles based on the number of times the movie was shown in theaters. Bear in mind, this was during a time when 150 rubles a month was considered very good pay. Slapstick comedy was relevant all around the world at the time. But nobody expected a film with such a homely working title like Amusing Stories to garner such success. Nobody except for director Leonid Gaidai, who would go on to set new box office records in the future. Operation Y was about restoring a student's dignity. The main character was named after Alexander Demyaninko, the actor who played the role. Before Shurik, all contemporary young movie protagonists were proletarian. But conversely, in Operation Y, a guy with glasses and a notebook was fending off a boorish working-class citizen. Not to mention a thieving commercial manager and some small-time thugs. In 1965, the entire country was keeping track of the news. And at that point, everybody knew what a computer was. Though people had yet to start using the English word computer itself. Computers were revered by numerous scientific research institutes, while being the main source of inspiration for science fiction authors. When preparing signs and warning labels for print, tabulating machines and computers are commonly used. These were the workhorses used by programmers back in the mid-60s. Ural brand mainframe computers. Gigantic cabinets with a multitude of flashing lights occupied hundreds of square meters of space. And personnel in white coats would be on duty round the clock. A new technological elite class emerged from discussions about assemblers. Yevgeny Yevtushenko was considered to be the Soviet Union's most famous post-war poet. In 1965, Unist magazine publishes his poem Bratsk Station, which began with the words, a poet in Russia is more than just a poet. Yevgeny Yevtushenko was the most prominent creator of poetry that was more than merely poetry. His bold wit contrasted with the timid news outlets, his individual civic stance stood out next to bland propaganda, and he would openly speak of love despite the official puritanism. Incidental circumstances bear more meaning than the poetry itself, since it is simply not enough for poetry to be nothing more than poetry. Yevtushenko became a household name during that era. There was a movie where the main character was telling someone over the phone what medicine he needed, which was Meridin. He spelled it out by letter. Mikhail, Ivan, Rodian, Yevtushenko, Meridin. A quote from a famous satirical monologue. As soon as they announced over the radio that the storm has blackened out the sky, she immediately asks, who is that, Zygismund? And before you know it, she answers, that's right, it's Yevtushenko. And here's a quote from the man himself. My last name is Russia. Yevtushenko is just a pen name. While the hunters were loading their rifles, nineteen sixty five gave housewives the pressure cooker. First, there was the Hungarian kuktam, followed by our own domestic product. Culinary autoclaves did exist before that, but only big ones for cafeterias. The new ones were smaller and meant for personal use. Pressure cookers were considered an attribute of ultra-modern households. This high-tech pot could be used to fully cook beef in 35 minutes, potatoes and beets in 10, or diced carrots in just one and a half. After defeating the esteemed Polina Astakhova, 16-year-old Natasha Kuczynska becomes the Soviet Union's new absolute gymnastics champion. Women's gymnastics saw a rapid influx of young blood. Currently on the beam we have gymnast from Leningrad Natasha Kuczynska, who is the absolute champion among school children. 
the older mature gymnasts would be replaced by teenage girls, who were petite, flexible and fearless. They would effortlessly perform extremely difficult tricks which nobody before them had the courage to even try. Kuczynska, with her straightforwardness and finely honed technique, quickly establishes a new style. But there was more to come. Kuczynska triumphed while being a full 16 years of age, but subsequent champions would receive their first gold medals before even acquiring their passports. Young blood in gymnastics came about due to a need for increased flexibility. Meanwhile, sports were a political matter. People watching TV would complain when they saw 12-, 13-year-old girls participate in women's competition. But thanks to those girls, the red flag would be raised ever the more often, accompanied by our national anthem. However, when they hit the beams, their future would quite literally take a hit as well. New names would come and go, until it reached a point when too many competitors would stand in the way towards eternal glory. One hundred years prior, elastic boys were in demand. But at that time, our country was in need of elastic girls. The country's TV production industry was struck with unification. Starting in 1965, virtually all Soviet household television sets became electrons. The production process was identical all across the board. They would all look different and be made under various brands and factories. The models Electron and Agonek comply with the strictest of global standards. The following Electrons weren't called Electrons. The Rubin 406, Agonek, Bireska, Chaikam, Voschod, and Izumrud. They all had 23-inch screens and were fitted with 16 lamps. Since 1963, enemy voices had been conveying to the Soviet Union songs by a fresh ensemble named the Beatles. Starting in 1964, the Soviet press could no longer ignore the sensation. It was safe to say that in 1965 the nation was struck with Beatlemania. As is the case with each and every star, they immediately developed a following, with imitators driving their respective generation into a state of madness. The term rock hadn't been invented yet. People would call the Beatles music Big Beat. In Soviet press, the name was translated to percussion bugs. The bugs would later become known as dung beetles, while thanks to Ringo Starr, the young generation would forever change its perception of the Russian word udarnik, which would no longer denote a shock worker, but would instead mean a drummer. Were you aware of your popularity in the USSR during the 60s and 70s? An enlarged photo of a photo would go for 5 rubles. They'd also sell smaller ones for 3 or even 1 ruble. The Beatles themselves would call their blank jackets Nehru tunics. Our word was Beatlovka. Rabotnitsa magazine published the pattern, presenting it under the guise of fashion trends in the socialist commonwealth. Beatles cassettes cost anywhere from 3 to 15 rubles, while records went for 20 to 30. Amateur bands started popping up next to schools and clubs playing songs from the Beatles repertoire. Their main goal was to sound exactly like the original. People would start learning English en masse by their music. The musicians from Liverpool all grew long hair because of Harrison, who was trying to hide his ears that stuck out. Guys, which one of you is bald? I am. Actually, we're all bald. From then on, the largest country in the world declared a war on long hair. The word Beatles was added to the Russian language, which is what you'd call a guy with long hair in school, college or at the factory. The Beatles turned out to be the most effective instrument of ideological sabotage in the 1960s. A satirical quote from Crocodile magazine. These musical bugs appeal to the lowest facets of human nature. Their skill set ends at howling, and they wouldn't have gotten anywhere without advertising. These bugs won't be able to sustain their success for long. They're simply not up to it. <laughs> 
However, the leaders of two superpowers agreed on the need for initiating a dialogue. Anastas Mikhayan resigns as the Soviet Union's formal president or chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. This marked the end of an incredible career which began under Lenin and continued until the Brezhnev era, from one Ilyich to another without having a heart attack or becoming paralyzed. Nikolai Podgorny was appointed as the new chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. Before that he was a Central Committee secretary, and prior to that he was first secretary of the Communist Party Central Committee in Ukraine. This trio of top-ranking officials, which included Brezhnev, Kasygin and Podgorny, would stand for the next 12 years. In August an armed conflict occurred, which would subsequently be called the Indo-Pakistani incident. In September, the two countries' leaders, Lal Bahadur Shastri and Ayub Khan, speak of a potential full-scale war between India and Pakistan. The subject of their disagreement was Kashmir Valley, where the two countries had been disputing their mutual border ever since India gained its independence. This was the second time these neighboring states went to war. It would seem that the rest of the world saw the conflict as a new rendition of the old story 1001 Nights, Lal Bahadur Shastri and Ayub Khan battling over the princely state Kashmir with tanks and airplanes. The Soviet Union offered to mediate in negotiations that would be held on our territory. Soviet authorities together with Kasygin decide to schedule an Indo-Pakistani summit, which would take place in early 1966 in Tashkent. In the fall of 1965, Eduard Streltsov, a superstar Russian soccer forward who was out of jail on parole, finally returned to the game, playing for the Moscow-based Dynamo football club. He was famously known as the Elephant. Seven years prior he had been charged with rape and sentenced to prison though many considered these allegations to be false. Streltsov was sent to jail despite the plaintiff dropping all charges. While at the prison camp, Streltsov played for his blocks team. His appearance at those prison matches would create such uproar that locals would think that there's a riot going on. Streltsov was released in 1963, and for the next two years he played for the factory team. In Gorky, where he was at first assigned by Torpedo Club management to the reserve team, the spectators threatened to burn down the stadium if they didn't let him out onto the playing field. Later on they restored his title of honored master of the sport, though they didn't let him participate in world championship games. Though by the end of the season they did name him the USSR's best soccer player. Streltsov could have been the Soviet Union's Pele, but instead he became the Soviet Union's Mike Tyson. The Soviet team rushes to attack the Austrian goalpost and succeeds. The winning goal was scored by Streltsov. Streltsov's fate was sealed by two satirical pieces. One of them was written by Simon Narignani, called On Diva Syndrome and printed before Streltsov was at that party in the Pravda township. The second one was called On Diva Syndrome again, written by Ilya Shatunovsky after said party. Back then these satirical articles on famous people were a destructive weapon. For example, Crooked Tap Dancing, written by Shatunovsky, put Lyudmila Gurchenko's active film career on a 15-year hiatus. He also threw the harsh moniker Star in a Volga at automotive enthusiast Mark Burness. Leonid Ilyich Brezhnev bestows a gold star medal upon Tatar Zhivkov. In 1965, at the very end of September, the Supreme Soviet approves a new holiday, Teacher's Day, which would be celebrated on the first Sunday of October. But Herzen's main mistake? Out of my class! Get out right now! Why? I have no desire to see you here! You and your antics! That completely derailed the lesson. Approving this holiday was sort of a moral incentive. The most popular among the creative and the most creative among the popular trades, the teaching profession remained one of the lowest paying jobs. On the first Saturday of October, which was the final school day before the weekend day on Sunday, teachers wouldn't flunk students, if they even asked them anything in the first place. Just like September 1st, the day of knowledge, Teacher's Day was all about autumn flowers, astras and gladioli, as well as the essential bouquets and garlands of crimson and yellow maple leaves. You need to sit straight behind your desks. Place your hands right in front of you, rest your feet on the bar, and carefully listen to your teacher. <laughs>
On July 24, 1965, a good 2,200 miles away from the Soviet border, at the 17th parallel dividing North and South Vietnam, Soviet anti-aircraft missiles shoot down four American planes. This marked the beginning of the USSR's active participation in the Vietnam War. North Vietnam had been a communist state for 10 years at that point. While the South Vietnam regime was predominantly under U.S. control, Red guerrillas operated in the South with support from the North. The Americans took punitive action against guerrillas while actively bombing North Vietnam. In February of 1965, an agreement is signed with the Soviet Union in Hanoi on supplying military equipment to North Vietnam. It appears that nobody had any doubt as to who was actually fighting against whom. We were facing off with the US yet again, in an exotic land of young socialism, whose freedom-loving people found themselves tangled in an uneven battle with the forces of evil. Starting in 1965, Cuba's place in mass consciousness was occupied by Vietnam. It wasn't in the Soviet Union's best interest to intervene in the Vietnam War. But there was no getting around our automatic reactionary desire to confront America. Then there was the infamous instigation on behalf of the Vietnamese government, which led to the war escalating while the Soviet Union's prime minister was paying the country a visit. Finally, we have the influence of proletarian internationalism rationale. Strangely enough, these events ended with the United States defeat. Thankfully, we had the will and the good judgment not to send our own troops down there, unlike the Americans. So they lost in the political and moral sense, and were forced to retreat for the next 10 years after. In March of 1965, the U.S. approves plans to escalate military action in Vietnam. Another 20,000 U.S. Marines were sent to Da Nang. Secretary of Defense McNamara threatens to initiate carpet bombing. Meanwhile, Soviet instructors assist in deploying anti-aircraft missile systems at the 17th parallel. For several years, Vietnam becomes the forefront of the battle between socialism and imperialism. The famous catacombs. South Vietnam guerrilla warriors had entire small towns underground. In regards to the Vietnam War, Soviet folk would call the people of North Vietnam freedom-loving, the people of South Vietnam heroic, the South Vietnam regime Saigon's puppets, with the word puppets no longer having anything to do with puppet shows, instead denoting Saigon. Anti-American rhetoric was at its peak. The terms American aggressor and American militarism were considered quite mild. People called the United States Air Force, the main adversary of our MiGs and anti-aircraft equipment, American vultures no less. But the pirates of the 20th century won't rob Vietnam of its sky, or of the sun, and they will never take away its freedom. Day and night, day and night, the world stubbornly recites, get your hands off, get your hands off, get your hands off Vietnam. Those are words from a song. However, the leaders of two superpowers agreed on the need for initiating a dialogue. In 1965, the Nobel Prize in Literature was awarded to a Russian author for the third time. After Ivan Bunin in 1933 and Boris Pasternak in 58, Mikhail Sholokhov becomes the Nobel laureate. The 1965 Nobel Prize award ceremony was held at the Stockholm Concert Hall. Arriving at the ceremony, we have the King of Sweden and members of the royal family. The Nobel Prize was awarded for the novel And Quiet Flows the Dawn, the first volume of which was published in 1928 and the last in 1940. The official statement went, For the artistic power and integrity with which he portrayed a historical phase of the Russian people's life in his epic piece about the dawn. The King of Sweden, Gustav VI Adolf, grants the author a medal and diploma of a Nobel Prize laureate. 
Mikhail Alexandrovich said, It brings me pride that this prize was bestowed upon a Russian author, one from the Soviet Union. Transistors, the latest attribute of urban style. It was so nice and convenient to take a stroll while holding a receiver in your hand with the antenna stretched out. The Spidola, produced by the Riga-based VEF factory, or Spidola as they called it, was the trendiest of the transistors. This was the very first domestic portable shortwave radio receiver. And it was such a well-thought-out device that they even exported them to Britain. This song is dedicated to the ladies working at the factory. So we've covered the year 1965 in our series the other day, 1961 to 1991, current era. After that we have 1966, the crackdown on hooligans, France withdrawing from NATO, village fiction, Amber the latest fashion trend, an earthquake in Tashkent, the Zaz 966, China's cultural revolution, March the 8th acknowledged as a holiday, and the birth of Via. See you for a new episode and a new year. Farewell.